The great sages approached Manu, who was seated with a collected mind, and, having duly worshipped him, spoke as follows. Dane, Divine One, to declare to us precisely and in due order the sacred laws of each of the, four chief, castes, Varna, and of the intermediate ones for thou, O Lord, alone knowest the purport, that is, the rites, and the knowledge of the soul, taught, in this whole ordinance of the self-existent, Svayambhu, which is unknowable and unfathomable. He, whose power is measureless, being thus asked by the high-minded great sages, duly honored them, and answered, Listen! This, universe, existed in the shape of darkness, unperceived, destitute of distinctive marks, unattainable by reasoning, unknowable, wholly immersed, as it were, in deep sleep than the divine self-existent. Svayambhu, himself, indiscernible, but, making, all, this, the great elements and the rest, discernible, appeared with irresistible, creative, power, dispelling the darkness he who can be perceived by the internal organ, alone, who is subtle, indiscernible, and eternal, who contains all created beings and is inconceivable, shown forth of his own, will, he, desiring to produce beings of many kinds from his own body, first with a thought created the waters, and placed his seed in the mat, seed, became a golden egg, in brilliancy equal to the sun, in that, egg, he himself was born as Braham, the progenitor of the whole world. The waters are called Nara, for, the waters are, indeed, the offspring of Nara, as they were his first residence, Ayana, he thence is named Narayana from that, first, cause, which is indiscernible, eternal, and both real and unreal, was produced that male, Purusha, who was famed in this world, under the appellation of, Braham the Divine One resided in that egg during a whole year, then he himself by his thought, alone, divided it into two halves, and out of those two halves he formed, heaven and earth, between them the middle sphere, the eight points of the horizon, and the eternal abode of the waters from himself, at Mana, he also drew forth the mind, which is both real and unreal, likewise from the mind egoism, which possesses the function of self-consciousness, and is, lordly moreover, the great one, the soul, and all, products, affected by the three qualities, and, in their order, the five organs which perceive the objects of sensation but, joining minute particles even of those six, which possess measureless power, with particles of himself, he created all beings because those six, kinds of, minute particles, which form the, creators, frame, enter, ashri, these, creatures, therefore the wise call his frame sarira, the body, that the great element center, together with their functions and the mind. Through its minute parts the framer of all beings, the imperishable one. But from minute body, framing, particles of these seven very powerful. Purushas springs this, world, the perishable from the imperishable among them each succeeding, element, acquires the quality of the preceding one, and whatever place, in the sequence, each of them occupies, even so many qualities it is declared to possess but in the beginning he assigned their several names, actions, and conditions. To all, created beings, even according to the words of the Veda he, the Lord, also created the class of the gods, who are endowed with life, and whose nature is action, and the subtle class of the sadhyas, and the eternal sacrifice but from fire, wind, and the sun he drew forth the threefold eternal Veda, called Rik, Yagas, and Saman, for the due performance of the sacrifice time and the divisions of time, the lunar mansions and the planets, the rivers, the oceans, the mountains, plains, and uneven ground austerity, speech, pleasure, desire, and anger. This whole creation he likewise produced, 
as he desired to call these beings into existence moreover, in order to distinguish actions, he separated merit from demerit, and he caused the creatures to be affected by the pairs of opposites, such as pain and pleasure but with the minute perishable particles of the five elements, which have been mentioned, this whole world is framed in due order but to whatever course of action the Lord at first appointed each kind of beings, that alone it has spontaneously adopted in each succeeding creation whatever he assigned to each at the first creation, noxiousness or harmlessness, gentleness or ferocity, virtue or sin, truth or falsehood, that clung afterwards spontaneously to it as at the change of the seasons each season of its own accord assumes its distinctive marks, even so corporeal beings, resume in new births, their appointed course of action but for the sake of the prosperity of the worlds he caused the Brahmana, the Kachatriya, the Vaisha, and the Sudra to proceed from his mouth, his arms, his thighs, and his feet dividing his own body, the Lord became half male and half female, with that, female, he produced Viragdot but no me, O most holy among the twice born, to be the creator of this whole, world, whom that male, Virag, himself produced, having performed austerities. Then I, desiring to produce created beings, performed very difficult austerities, and, thereby, called into existence ten great sages, lords of created beings, Mariki, Atri, Andras, Pulastya, Pulaha, Kratu, Prakitas, Vasishta, Brigu, and Narada. They created seven other manas possessing great brilliancy, gods and classes of gods and great sages of measureless power, Yakshas, the servants of Kubra, the demons called, Rakshasas and Pisakas, Gandharvas, or musicians of the gods, Upsaurasas, the dancers of the gods, Azuras, the snake deities called, Nagas and Sarpas, the bird deities called, Saparnas and the several lightnings, thunderbolts and clouds, imperfect, Rahata, and perfect rainbows, falling meteors, supernatural noises, comets, and heavenly lights of many kinds, horse-faced, kinaras, monkeys, fishes, birds of many kinds, cattle, deer, men, and carnivorous beasts with two rows of teeth. Small and large worms and beetles, moths, lice, flies, bugs, all stinging and biting insects and the several kinds of immovable things. Thus was this whole creation both the immovable and the movable, produced by those high-minded ones by means of austerities and at my command, each being, according to, the results of, its actions. But whatever act is stated, to belong, to, each of, those creatures here below, that I will truly declare to you, as well as their order in respect to birth. Cattle, deer, carnivorous beasts with two rows of teeth, Rakshasas, Pisakas, and men are born from the womb. From eggs are born birds, snakes, crocodiles, fishes, tortoises, as well as similar terrestrial and aquatic, animals. From hot moisture spring stinging and biting insects, lice, flies, bugs, and all other, creatures, of that kind which are produced by heat. All plants, propagated by seed or by slips, grow from shoots, annual plants, are those, which, bearing many flowers and fruits, perish after the ripening of their fruit, those trees, which bear fruit without flowers are called Vanaspati, lords of the forest, but those which bear both flowers and fruit are called Vriksha. But the various plants with many stalks, growing from one or several roots, the different kinds of grasses, the climbing plants and the creepers spring all from seed or from slips. These, plants, which are surrounded by multiform darkness, the result of their acts, in former existences, possess internal consciousness and experience pleasure and pain. 
the various conditions in this always terrible and constantly changing circle of births and deaths to which created beings are subject are stated to begin with that of braham and to end with that of these just mentioned immovable creatures when he whose power is incomprehensible had thus produced the universe and men he disappeared in himself repeatedly suppressing one period by means of the other when that divine one wakes then this world stirs when he slumbers tranquilly then the universe sinks to sleep but when he reposes in calm sleep the corporeal beings whose nature is action desist from their actions and mind becomes inert when they are absorbed all at once in that great soul then he who is the soul of all beings sweetly slumbers free from all care and occupation when this soul has entered darkness it remains for a long time united with the organs of sensation but performs not its functions it then leaves the corporeal frame when being clothed with minute particles only it enters into vegetable or animal seed it then assumes united with the fine body a new corporeal frame thus he the imperishable one by alternately waking and slumbering incessantly revivifies and destroys this whole movable and immovable creation but he having composed these institutes of the sacred law himself taught them according to the rule to me alone in the beginning next I taught them to Mariki and the other sages Brigu here will fully recite to you these institutes for that sage learn the whole in its entirety from me then that great sage Brigu being thus addressed by Manu spoke pleased in his heart to all the sages listen six other high-minded very powerful manus who belong to the race of this Manu the descendant of the self-existent Svayambu and who have severally produced created beings are Svarakisha, Atami, Tamasa, Rivata, Kakshusha, possessing great luster, and the son of Vivasvat these seven very glorious Manus, the first among whom is Vayampuva, produced and protected this whole movable and immovable creation, each during the period, allotted to him, eighteen Nimshas, twinklings of the eye, are one Kashtha, thirty Kashthas one Kala, thirty Kalas one Murta, and as many, Murtas, one day and night the sun divides days and nights, both human and divine, the night, being intended, for the repose of created beings and the day for exertion a month is a day and a night of the manes, but the division is according to fortnights, the dark, fortnight, is their day for active exertion, the bright, fortnight, their night for sleep a year is a day and a night of the gods, their division is, as follows, the half year during which the sun progresses to the north will be the day, that during which it goes southwards the night but here now the brief, description of, the duration of a night and a day of Braham and of the several ages, of the world, Yuga, according to their order they declare that the Krita age, consists of, 4000 years, of the gods, the twilight preceding it consists of as many hundreds, and the twilight following it of the same number in the other three ages with their twilights preceding and following, the thousands and hundreds are diminished by one, in each, these twelve thousand, years, which thus have been just mentioned as the total of four, human, ages are called one age of the gods but know that the sum of one thousand ages of the gods makes one day of Braham and that his night has the same length those only who know that the holy day of Braham indeed ends after the completion of one thousand ages of the gods and that his night lasts as long are really men acquainted with the length of days and nights at the end of that day and night he who is asleep awakes and after awaking creates mind which is both real and unreal mind impelled by Braham's desire to create performs the work of creation by modifying itself then seether is produced 
they declare that sound is the quality of the latter but from ether, modifying itself, springs the pure, powerful wind, the vehicle of all perfumes, that is held to possess the quality of touch next from wind modifying itself, precedes the brilliant light, which illuminates and dispels darkness, that is declared to possess the quality of color and from light, modifying itself, is produced, water, possessing the quality of taste, from water earth which is the quality of smell, such is the creation in the beginning the before mentioned age of the gods, or 12,000, of their years, being multiplied by 71, constitutes what, is here named the period of Amanu, Manvantara, the Manvantaras, the creations and destructions, of the world, are, numberless, sporting, as it were, Braham repeats this again and again in the Krita age Dharma is four-footed and entire, and, so is, truth, nor does any gain accrue to men by unrighteousness in the other, three ages, by reason of, unjust, gains, Agama, Dharma is deprived successively of one foot, and through, the prevalence of, theft, falsehood, and fraud the merit, gained by men, is diminished by one-fourth, in each, men are, free from disease, accomplish all their aims, and live four hundred years in the Krita age, but in the Trita and, in each of, the succeeding, ages, their life is lessened by one quarter the life of mortals, mentioned in the Veda, the desired results of sacrificial rites and the, supernatural, power of embodied, spirits, are fruits proportioned among men according to, the character of, the age one set of duties, is prescribed, for men in the Krita age, different ones in the Trita and in the Dvapara, and, again, another, set, in the Kali, in a proportion as, those, ages decrease in length in the Krita age the chief, virtue, is declared to be, the performance of, austerities, in the Trita, divine, knowledge, in the Dvapara, the performance of, sacrifices, in the Kali liberality alone but in order to protect this universe he, the most resplendent one, assigned separate, duties and, occupations to those who sprang from his mouth, arms, thighs, and feet to Brahman as he assigned teaching and studying, the Veda, sacrificing for their own benefit and for others, giving and accepting, of alms, the Kachatriya he commanded to protect the people, to bestow gifts, to offer sacrifices, to study, the Veda, and to abstain from attaching himself to sensual pleasures, the Vaisha to tend cattle, to bestow gifts, to offer sacrifices, to study, the Veda, to trade, to lend money, and to cultivate land one occupation only the Lord prescribed to the Sudra, to serve meekly even these, other, three castes man is stated to be purer above the navel, than below, hence the self-existent, Svayambhu, has declared the purest, part, of him, to be, his mouth as the Brahmana sprang from, Braham's, mouth, as he was the firstborn, and as he possesses the Veda, he is by right the lord of this whole creation for the self-existent, Svayambhu, having performed austerities, produced him first from his own mouth, in order that the offerings might be conveyed to the gods and manes and that this universe might be preserved what created being can surpass him, through whose mouth the gods continually consume the sacrificial viands and the manes the offerings to the dead? Of created beings the most excellent are said to be those which are animated, of the animated, those which subsist by intelligence, of the intelligent, mankind, and of men, the Brahmanas of Brahmanas, those learned, in the Veda, of the learned, those who recognize, the necessity and the manner of performing the prescribed duties, of those who possess this knowledge, those who perform them, of the performers, those who know the Braham the very birth of a Brahmana is an eternal incarnation of the sacred law, for he is born to, fulfill, the sacred law, and becomes one with Braham or Brahmana, coming into existence, is born as the highest on earth, the lord of all created beings. 
for the protection of the treasury of the law whatever exists in the world is, the property of the Brahmana, on account of the excellence of his origin the Brahmana is, indeed, entitled to all the Brahmana eats but his own food, wears but his own apparel, bestows but his own inams, other mortals subsist through the benevolence of the Brahmana in order to clearly settle his duties those of the other, castes, according to their order, wise men who sprung from the self-existent, composed these institutes, of the sacred law, a learned Brahmana must carefully study them, and he must duly instruct his pupils in them, but nobody else, shall do it, a Brahmana who studies these institutes, and, faithfully fulfills the duties, prescribed therein, is never tainted by sins, arising from thoughts, words, or deeds he sanctifies any company, which he may enter, seven ancestors and seven descendants, and he alone deserves, to possess, this whole earth, to study, this, work, is the best means of securing welfare, it increases understanding, it procures fame and long life, it, leads to, supreme bliss in this, work, the sacred law has been fully stated as well as the good and bad qualities of, human, actions and the immemorial rule of conduct, to be followed, by all the forecasts, Varna, the rule of conduct is transcendent law, whether it be taught in the revealed texts or in the sacred tradition, hence a twice born man who possesses regard for himself, should be always careful to, follow, it a Brahmana who departs from the rule of conduct, does not reap the fruit of the Veda, but he who duly follows it, will obtain the full reward the sages who saw that the sacred law is thus grounded on the rule of conduct, have taken good conduct to be the most excellent root of all austerity the creation of the universe, the rule of the sacraments, the ordinances of studentship, and the respectful behavior, towards gurus, the most excellent rule of bathing, on return from the teacher's house, the law of, marriage and the description of the, various, marriage rites, the regulations for the great sacrifices and the eternal rule of the funeral sacrifices the description of the modes of, gaining, subsistence and the duties of a snataka, the rules regarding, lawful and forbidden food, the purification of men and of things, the laws concerning women, the law, of hermits, the manner of gaining, final emancipation and, of, renouncing the world, the whole duty of a king and the manner of deciding lawsuits, the rules for the examination of witnesses, the laws concerning husband and wife, the law of, inheritance and, division, the law concerning, gambling and the removal of, men innocuous like, thorns, the law concerning, the behavior of Vasias and Sudras, the origin of the mixed castes, the law for all castes in times of distress and the law of penances, the threefold course of transmigrations, the result of, good or bad, actions, the manner of attaining, supreme bliss and the examination of the good and bad qualities of actions, the primeval laws of countries, of castes, gadi, of families, and the rules concerning heretics and companies, of traders and the like, all that, Manu has declared in these institutes as Manu, in reply to my questions, formerly promulgated these institutes, even so learn ye also the, whole work, from me. End of chapter 1 Learn that sacred law which is followed by men learned, in the Veda, and assented to in their hearts by the virtuous, who are ever exempt from Hatred and inordinate affection dot to act solely from a desire for rewards is not laudable, yet an exemption from that desire is not, to be found, in this, world, for on, that, desire is grounded the study of the Veda and the performance of the actions, prescribed by the Veda dot the desire, for rewards, indeed, has its root in the conception that an act can yield them, and in consequence of, that, conception sacrifices are performed, vows and the laws prescribing restraints are all stated to be kept through the idea that they not a single act here, below, appears ever to be done by a man free from desire. 
For whatever man does, it is the result of the impulse of desire. He who persists in discharging these prescribed duties in the right manner reaches the deathless state and even in this life obtains the fulfillment of all the desires that he may have conceived. The whole Veda is the first source of the sacred law, next the tradition and the virtuous conduct of those who know the Veda further, also the customs of holy men, and, finally, self-satisfaction. Whatever law has been ordained for any person, by Manu, that has been fully declared in the Veda, for that sage was omniscient. But a learned man after fully scrutinizing all this with the eye of knowledge, should, in accordance with the authority of the revealed texts, be intent on the performance of his duties. For that man who obeys the law prescribed in the revealed texts and in the sacred tradition, gains fame in this world, and after death unsurpassable bliss. But by Sruti, revelation, is meant the Veda, and by Smriti, tradition, the institutes of the sacred law, those two must not be called into question in any matter, since from those two the sacred law shone forth. Every twice born man, who, relying on the institutes of dialectics, treats with contempt those two sources of the law, must be cast out by the virtuous, as an atheist and a scorner of the Veda. The Veda, the sacred tradition, the customs of virtuous men, and one's own pleasure, they declare to be visibly the fourfold means of defining the sacred law. The knowledge of the sacred law is prescribed for those who are not given to the acquisition of wealth and to the gratification of their desires. To those who seek the knowledge of the sacred law the supreme authority is the revelation, Sruti. But when two sacred texts, Sruti, are conflicting, both are held to be law, for both are pronounced by the wise, to be, valid law. Thus, the Agniatra sacrifice may be, optionally, performed, at any time after the sun has risen, before he has risen, or when neither sun nor stars are visible. That is declared by Vedic texts. Know that he for whom the performance of the ceremonies beginning with the rite of impregnation, Garbhadana, and ending with the funeral rite, Antishti, is prescribed, while sacred formulas are being recited is entitled, to study, these institutes. That land, created by the gods, which lies between the two divine rivers. Sarasvati and Rishadvati, the, sages, call Brahmavarta. The custom handed down in regular succession, since time immemorial, among the, four chief, castes, Varna, and the mixed, races, of that country, is called the conduct of virtuous men. The plain of the Kuras, the country of the Matsyas, Pankalas, and Surasinakas, these form, indeed, the country of the Brahmarshas, Brahmanical sages, which ranks immediately after Brahmavarta. From a Brahmana, born in that country, let all men on earth learn their several usages. That country, which lies between the Himavat and the Vindhya, mountains, to the east of Prayaga and to the west of Vinasana, the place where the river Sarasvati disappears, is called Madhyadesa, the central region. But, the tract, between those two mountains, just mentioned, which, extends, as far as the eastern and the western oceans, the wise call Aryavarta, the country of the Aryans. That land where the black antelope naturally roams, one must note to be fit for the performance of sacrifices, the tract, different from that, is, the country of the Mlepkas, barbarians. Let twice-born men seek to dwell in those, above-mentioned countries, but a sudra, distressed for subsistence, may reside anywhere. Thus has the origin of the sacred law been succinctly described to you and the origin of this universe. Learn, now, the duties of the castes, Varna. With holy rites, prescribed by the Veda, must the ceremony on conception and other sacraments be performed for twice-born men, which sanctify the body and purify, from sin, in this, life, and after death. By burnt oblations during, the, mother's, pregnancy, by the Ritakarman, the ceremony after birth, the Kada, Dancher, and the Mangja Bandana, the tying of the,
sacred girdle of manga grass, is the taint, derived from both parents. Removed from twice born by the study of the Veda, by vows, by burned oblations, by the recitation of sacred texts, by the acquisition of the threefold sacred science, by offering to the gods, Rishas, and Manes, by the procreation of sons, by the great sacrifices, and by before the navel string is cut, the Gita Karman, birthright, must be performed for a male child, and while sacred formulas are being recited, he must be fed with gold, honey, and butter. But let the father perform more, cause to be performed the Namadhya, the right of naming the child, on the tenth or twelfth day after birth, or on a lucky lunar day, in a lucky murda, under an auspicious constellation. Let the first part of a Brahmana's name denote something auspicious, a Kachatriyas be connected with power, and a Vaishas with wealth, but a Sudras express something contemptible. The second part of a Brahmana's name shall be a word implying happiness of a Kachatriyas, a word implying protection of a Vaishas, a term expressive of thriving, and of a Sudras, an expression denoting service. The names of women should be easy to pronounce, not imply anything dreadful, possess a plain meaning, be pleasing and auspicious, end in long vowels, and contain a word of benediction. In the fourth month the Nishkramana, the first leaving of the house, of the child should be performed, in the sixth month the Anaprasena, first feeding with rice, and optionally, any other, auspicious ceremony required by, the custom of, the family. According to the teaching of the revealed texts, the Kudakarman Dantshar, must be performed, for the sake of spiritual merit, by all twice-born men in the first or third year. In the eighth year after conception, one should perform the initiation, of Anayana, of a Brahmana, in the eleventh after conception, that, of a Kachatriya, but in the twelfth that of a Vaisha. The initiation, of a Brahmana who desires proficiency in sacred learning should take place in the fifth, year after conception, that, of a Kachatriya who wishes to become powerful in the sixth, and that, of a Vaisha who longs for, success in his, Basmi, time for the, Savitri, initiation, of a Brahmana does not pass until the completion of the sixteenth year, after, conception, of a Kachatriya until the completion of the 22nd, and of a Vaisha until the completion of the 24th. After those, periods men of, these three, castes, who have not received the, sacrament at the proper time, become Vradiyas, outcasts, excluded from the Savitri, initiation, and despised by the Aryans. With such men, if they have not been purified according to the rule, let no Brahmana ever, even in times of distress, form a connection either through the Veda or by marriage. Let students, according to the order of their castes, wear, as upper dresses, the skins of black antelopes, spotted deer, and he goats, and lower garments, made of hemp, flax, or wool. The girdle of a Brahmana shall consist of a, of a triple cord of manga grass, smooth and soft, that of a kachatriya, of a bowstring made of Merva fibers, that, of a Vaisha, of hempen threads. If manga grass, and so forth, be not procurable, the girdles, may be made of Kuza, Asmantaka, and Balbaga, fibers, with a single threefold knot, or with three or five, knots according to the custom of the family. The sacrificial string of a Brahmana shall be made of cotton, shall be, twisted to the right, and consist, of three threads, that of a Kachatriya of hempen threads, and, that of a Vaisha of woolen threads. A Brahmana shall, carry, according to the sacred law, a staff of Bilva or Palosa, a Kachatriya, of Vata or Kadira, and, a Vaisha, of Pilu or Udamara. The staff of a Brahmana shall be made of such length as to reach the end of his hair, that of a Kachatriya, to reach his forehead, and, that of a Vaisha, to reach, the tip of his, nose. Let all the staves be straight, without a blemish, handsome to look at, not likely to terrify men, with their bark perfect, unhurt by fire. Having taken the staff according to his choice, 
Having worshipped the sun and walked round the fire, turning his right hand towards it, the student, should beg alms according to the prescribed rule. An initiated Brahmana should beg, beginning, his request with the word, Lady, Bhavati, Akachatriya, placing, the word, Lady in the middle, Bhattavaisha, placing it at the end, of the formula. Let him first beg food of his mother, or of his sister, or of his own maternal aunt, or of, some other, female who will not disgrace him, by air fusel. Having collected as much food as is required, from several persons, and having announced it without guile to his teacher, let him eat, turning his face towards the east, and having purified himself by sipping water. His meal will procure, long life, if he eats facing the east, fame, if he turns to the south, prosperity, if he turns to the west, truthfulness, if he faces the east. Let a twice born man always eat his food with concentrated mind, after performing an ablution, and after he has eaten, let him duly cleanse himself with water and sprinkle the cavities of his head. Let him always worship his food, and eat it without contempt, when he sees it, let him rejoice, show a pleased face, and pray that he may always obtain it. Food, that is always worshipped, gives strength and manly vigor, but eaten irreverently, it destroys them both. Let him not give to any man what he leaves, and beware of eating between, the two meal times, let him not overeat himself, nor go anywhere without having purified himself after his meal. Excessive eating is prejudicial to health, to fame, and to bliss in heaven. It prevents the acquisition of spiritual merit, and is odious among men. Why not, for these reasons, to avoid it carefully. Let a Brahmana always sip water out of the part of the hand, Tirtha, sacred to Braham, or out of that sacred to Ka, Pragapati, or out of that sacred to the gods, never out of that sacred to the manes. They call, the part, at the root of the thumb the tirtha sacred to Braham, that at the root of the, little, finger, the tirtha, sacred to Ka, Pragapati, that, at the tips, of the fingers, the tirtha, sacred to the gods, and that below, between the end let him first sip water thrice, next twice wipe his mouth, and, lastly, touch with water the cavities, of the head, the seat of, the soul and the head. He who knows the sacred law and seeks purity shall always perform the rite of sipping with water neither hot nor frothy, with a, prescribed, tirtha, in a lonely place, and turning to the east or to the north. A Brahmana is purified by water that reaches his heart, a kachatri by water reaching his throat, a vaisha by water taken into his mouth and, a sudra by water touched with the extremity, of his lips. A twice-born man is called up a vitan when his right arm is raised, and the sacrificial string or the dress, passed under it, rests on the left shoulder, when his, left, arm, is raised, and the string, or the dress, passed under it, rests on the right show his girdle, the skin, which serves as his upper garment, his staff, his sacrificial thread, and, his water pot he must, throw into water, when they have been damaged, and take others, reciting sacred formulas. The ceremony called, Kesanda, clipping the hair, is ordained for a Brahmana in the sixteenth year, from conception, for a Kachatriya, in the twenty-second, and for a Vaisha, two, years, later than that. This whole series, of ceremonies, must be performed for females, also, in order to sanctify the body, at the proper time and in the proper order, but without, the recitation of, sacred texts. The nuptial ceremony is stated to be the, Vedic sacrament for women, and to be equal to the initiation, serving the husband, equivalent to, the residence in, the house of the, teacher, and the household duties, the same, as the, daily, worship of the sacra thus has been described the rule for the initiation of the twice born, which indicates a, new, birth, and sanctifies, learn, now, to what duties they must afterwards supply themselves. Having performed the, right of, initiation, the teacher must first instruct the, pupil, in, the rules of, personal purification, of conduct, of the fire worship, 
and of the twilight devotions. But, a student, who is about to begin the study, of the Veda, shall receive instruction, after he has sipped water in accordance with the institutes, of the sacred law, has made the Brahmanjali, has put on, a clean dress, and has brought his organs at the beginning and at the end of, a lesson in the, Veda he must always clasp both the feet of his teacher, and, he must study, joining his hands, that is called the Brahmangali, joining the palms for the sake of the Veda. With crossed hands he must clasp, the feet, of the teacher, and touch the left, foot, with his left, hand, the right, foot, with his right, hand but to him who is about to begin studying, the teacher always unwearied, must say, ho, recite, he shall leave off, when the teacher says, let a stoppage take place. Let him always pronounce the syllable om at the beginning and at the end of, a lesson in, the Veda, for, unless the syllable om proceed, the lesson, will slip away, from him, and unless it follow it will fade away. Seated on, blades of Pusa grass, with their points to the east, purified by Pavitras, blades of Pusa grass, and sanctified by three suppressions of the breath, Pranyama, he is worthy, to pronounce, the syllable om. Pragapati, the lord of creatures, milked out, as it were, from the three Vedas the sounds A, U, and M, and, the Vyaratas, Ba, Bhuva, Zva. Moreover from the three Vedas Pragapati, who dwells in the highest heaven, Paramsh Thin, milked out, as it were, that trick verse, sacred to Savitri, Savitri, which begins with the word Dad, one foot from each dot a Brahmana, learned in the Veda, who recites during both twilights that syllable and that verse, preceded by the Vyaratas, gains the whole merit which the recitation of the Vedas confers. A twice born man who daily repeats those three one thousand times outside the village will be freed after a month even from great guilt, as a snake from its slough. The Brahmana the Kachatriya, and the Vaisha who neglect, the recitation of that trek verse and the timely, performance of the, rites, prescribed for, them, will be blamed among virtuous men. Know that the three imperishable Mahavyaratas, preceded by the syllable Om, and, followed, by the three-footed Savitri are the portal of the Veda and the gate leading, to union with, Braham. He who daily recites that, verse, untired, during three years, will enter, after death, the highest Braham, move as free as air, and assume an ethereal form. The monosyllable, um, is the highest Braham, three, suppressions of the breath are the best, form of, austerity, but nothing surpasses the savitri truthfulness is better than silence. All rites ordained in the Veda, burnt oblations and, other, sacrifices, pass away, but know that the syllable, um, is imperishable, and, it is, Braham, and the Lord of Creatures, Bragapati. An offering, consisting of muttered prayers, is ten times more efficacious than a sacrifice performed according to the rules, of the Veda. A, prayer, which is inaudible, to others, surpasses it a hundred times, and the Mendel, recitation of sacred texts the four Pukayagnas and those, Sacrifices which are enjoined by the rules, of the Veda, are altogether not equal in value to a sixteenth part of the sacrifice consisting of muttered prayers. But, undoubtedly, a Brahmana reaches the highest goal by muttering prayers only, whether, he perform other, rites, or neglect them, he who befriends, all creatures, is declared, to be, a, true. Brahmana. A wise man should strive to restrain his organs which run wild among alluring sensual objects, like a charioteer his horses. Those eleven organs which former sages have named, I will properly, and, precisely enumerate in due order, viz, the ear, the skin, the eyes, the tongue, and the nose as the fifth, the anus, the organ of generation, hands and feet and the, organ of, speech, named as the tenth dot five of them, the ear and the rest according to their order, they call organs of sense, and five of them, the anus and the rest, organs of action. Dot know that the internal organ, manas, is the eleventh, which by its quality belongs to both, sets, 
When that has been subdued, both those sets of five have been conquered. Dot through the attachment of his organs, to sensual pleasure, a man doubtlessly will incur guilt, but if he keep them under complete control, he will obtain success, in gaining all his aims. Desire is never extinguished by the enjoyment of desired objects, it only grows stronger like a fire, fed, with clarified butter. If one man should obtain all those, sensual enjoyments, and another should renounce them all, the renunciation of all pleasure is far better than the attainment of them. Those, organs, which are strongly attached to sensual pleasures, cannot so effectually be restrained by abstinence from enjoyments, as by a constant, pursuit of true, knowledge. Neither, the study of, the Vedas, nor liberality, nor sacrifices, nor any, self-imposed, restraint, nor austerities, ever procure the attainment, of rewards, to a man whose heart is contaminated, by sensuality. That man may be considered to have, really, subdued his organs, who on hearing and touching and seeing, on tasting and smelling, anything, neither rejoices nor repines. But when one among all the organs slips away, from control, thereby, man's, wisdom slips away from him, even as the water, flows, through the one, open, foot of a, water carrier's, skin. If he keeps all the, ten, organs as well as the mind in subjection, he may gain all his aims, without reducing his body by, the practice, of yoga. Let him stand during the morning twilight, muttering the savagery until the sun appears, but, let him recite it seated, in the evening until the constellations can be seen distinctly. He who stands during the morning twilight muttering, the savagery, removes the guilt contracted during the previous night, but he who recites it, seated, in the evening, destroys the sin he committed during the day. But he who does not worship, standing in the morning, nor sitting in the evening, shall be excluded, just like a sudra from all the duties and rights of an Aryan god he who, desires to, perform the ceremony, of the, daily, recitation, may even recite the savagery near water, retiring into the forest, controlling his organs and concentrating his mind. Both when, one studies, the supplementary treatises of the Veda, and when, one recites, the daily portion of the Veda, no regard need be paid to forbidden days, likewise when, one repeats, the sacred texts required for a burnt oblation. There are no forbidden days for the daily recitation, since that is declared to be a Brahma Satra, an everlasting sacrifice offered to Braham. At that, the Veda takes the place of the burnt oblations, and it is meritorious, even when natural phenomena for him who, being pure and controlling his organs, during a year daily recites the Veda according to the rule, that, daily recitation, will ever cause sweet and sour milk, clarified butter and honey to flow. Let an Aryan who has been initiated, daily, offer fuel in the sacred fire, beg food, sleep on the ground and do what is beneficial to this teacher, until, he performs the ceremony of Samavartana, on returning home. According to the sacred law the, following, ten, persons, viz, the teacher's son, one who desires to do service, one who imparts knowledge, one who is intent on fulfilling the law, one who is pure, a person connected by marriage or friendship, one who po unless one be asked, one must not explain, anything, to anybody, nor, must one answer, a person who asks improperly, let a wise man, though he knows, the answer, behave among men as, if he were, an idiot. Dot of the two persons, him who illegally, explains, anything, and him who illegally asks, a question, one, or both, will die or incur, the others, enmity. Dot where merit and wealth are not, obtained by teaching, nor, at least, do obedience, in such, soil, sacred knowledge must not be sown, just as good seed, must, not, be thrown, on barren land. Even in times of dire distress a teacher of the Veda should rather die with his knowledge than sow it in barren soil. Sacred learning approached a Brahmana and said to him, I am thy treasure, preserve me, deliver me not to 
a scorner, so, preserved, I shall become supremely strong. But deliver me, as to the keeper of thy treasure, to a Brahmana whom thou shalt know to be pure, of subdued senses, chaste and attentive. But he who acquires without permission the Veda from one who recites it, incurs the guilt of stealing the Veda, and shall sink into hell. A student, shall first reverentially salute that teacher, from whom he receives, knowledge, referring to worldly affairs, to the Veda, or to the Brahman. A Brahmana who completely governs himself, though he know the Savitri only, is better than he who knows the three Vedas, but, does not control himself, eats all, sorts of, food, and sells all, sorts of goods. One must not sit down on a couch or seat which a superior occupies, and he who occupies a couch or seat shall rise to meet a superior, and, afterwards, salute him. For the vital airs of a young man mount upwards to leave his body when an elder approaches, but by arising to meet him and saluting he recovers them. He who habitually salutes and constantly pays reverence to the aged obtains an increase of four things, viz., length of life knowledge, fame, and strength. After the word of salutation, a Brahmana who greets an elder must pronounce his name, saying, I am N. N. To those persons who, when a name is pronounced, do not understand the meaning of the salutation, a wise man should say, it is I, and he should address in the same manner all women. In saluting he should pronounce after his name the word Ba, for the sages have declared that the nature of Ba is the same as that of all proper names. A Brahmana should thus be saluted in return, mayst thou be long lived, O gentle one. And the vowel must be added at the end of the name of the person addressed, the syllable preceding it being drawn out to the length of three moras. A Brahmana who does not know the form of returning a salutation, must not be saluted by a learned man, as a sudra, even so is he. Let him ask a Brahmana, on meeting him, after, his health, with the word, kusala, a kachatriya, with the word, animaya, a vaisha, with the word, kshima, and a sudra, with the word, an Arajya. He who has been initiated, to perform a Srata sacrifice, must not be addressed by his name, even though he be a younger man, he who knows the sacred law must use in speaking to such, a man the particle, band, the pronoun, Bhavat, your worship. But to a female who is the wife of another man, and not a blood relation, he must say, Lady Bhavati, or beloved sister, to his maternal and paternal uncles, fathers-in-law, officiating priests, and other, venerable persons, he must say, I, am N, N, and rise, to meet them, even though they be younger, than himself. A maternal aunt, the wife of a maternal uncle, a mother-in-law, and a paternal aunt must be honored like the wife of one's teacher, they are equal to the wife of one's teacher. The feet of the, wife of one's brother, if she be of the same caste, Varna, must be clasped every day, but, the feet of, wives of, other, paternal and maternal. Relatives need only be embraced on one's return from a journey. Towards a sister of one's father and of one's mother, and towards one's own elder sister, one must behave as towards one's mother, but, the mother is more venerable than they. Fellow citizens are called friends, and equals though one be, ten years, older than the other, men practicing, the same, fine art, though one be, five, years, older than the other, sratrayas, though, three years, intervene between, their ages, but blood one thirty-five know that a brahmana of ten years and kachatriya of a hundred years stand to, each other in the relation of father and son, but between those two the, brahmana is the father. Wealth, kindred, age, the do. Performance of, rites, and, fifthly, sacred learning are titles to respect, but each later named, cause, is more weighty, than the preceding ones. Whatever man of the three, highest, castes possesses most of those five, both in number and degree, that man is worthy of honor among them, and, so is, also a sudra who has entered the tenth, decade of his life. 
way must be made for a man in a carriage, for one who is above 90 years old, for one diseased, for the carrier of a burden, for a woman, for a snataka, for the king, and for a bridegroom dug among all those, if they meet, at one time, a snataka and the king must be, most, honored, and if the king and a snataka, meet, the latter receives respect from the king. They call that Brahmana who initiates a pupil and teaches him the Veda together with the Kalpa and the Rihusyas, the teacher, Akriya, of the latter. But he who for his livelihood teaches a portion only of the Veda, or also the Angas of the Veda, is called the sub-teacher, Apadhyaya. That Brahmana, who performs in accordance with the rules, of the Veda, the rites, the Garbhadana, conception rite, and so forth, and gives food, to the child, is called the Guru, the Venerable One. He who, being, duly, chosen, for the purpose, performs the Agnyadhya, the Pukhyagnas, and, the, Srada, sacrifices, such as the Agnishtoma, for another man, is called, his, officiating priest. That, man, who truthfully fills both his ears with the Veda, the pupil, shall consider as his father and mother, he must never offend him. The teacher, Akriya, is ten times more venerable than a sub-teacher, Apadhyaya, the father a hundred times more than the teacher, but the mother a thousand times more than the father. Of him who gives natural birth and him who gives the knowledge of the Veda, the giver of the Veda is the more venerable father, for the birth for the sake of the Veda, ensures eternal rewards, both in this life and after death. Let him consider that. He received, a, mere animal, existence, when his parents begat him through mutual affection, and when he was born from the womb, of his mother. But that birth which a teacher acquainted with the whole Veda, in accordance with the law, procures for him through the savitri, is real, exempt from age and death. The pupil, must know that that man also who benefits him by, instruction in, the Veda, be it little or much, is called in these, institutes, his guru, in consequence of that benefit, conferred by instruction in, the Veda. That Brahmana who is the giver of the birth for the sake of the Veda and the teacher of the prescribed duties becomes by law the father of an aged man, even though he himself be a child. Young Kavi, the son of Andres, taught his relatives who were old enough to be fathers, and, as he excelled them in sacred knowledge, he called them little sons. They, moved with resentment, asked the gods concerning that matter, and the gods, having assembled, answered, The child has addressed you properly. For, a man, destitute of sacred knowledge is indeed a child, and he who teaches him the Veda is his father. For, the sages, have always said child to an ignorant man, and father to a teacher of the Veda. Neither through years, nor through white hairs, nor through wealth, nor through powerful kinsmen, comes greatness. The sages have made this law, he who has learnt the Veda, together with the Angas, Anukana, is considered great by us. The seniority of Brahmanas is from sacred knowledge, that of Kshatriyas from valor, that of Vaisyas from wealth and grain and other goods, but that of Sudras alone from age. A man is not therefore, considered, venerable because his head is grey, him, who, though young, has learned the Veda, the gods consider to be venerable. As an elephant made of wood, as an antelope made of leather, such is an unlearned Brahmana, those three have, nothing but the names, of their kind. As a eunuch is unproductive with women, as a cow with a cow is unprolific, and as a gift made to an ignorant man yields no reward, even so is a Brahmana useless, who, does, not, know, the Rikas. Created beings must be instructed in, what concerns, their welfare without, giving them pain, and sweet and gentle speech must be used by, a teacher, who, desires, to abide by, the sacred law. He, forsooth, whose speech and thoughts are pure and ever perfectly, guarded, gains the whole reward which is conferred by the Vedanta. Let him not, even though in pain, speak words, cutting, others, to the quick, let him not injure others in thought or deed, let him not utter, 
speeches which make others afraid of him, since that will prevent him from gaining heaven. A Brahmana should always fear homage as if it were poison, and constantly desire to suffer, scorn as he would long for nectar. For he who is scorned, nevertheless, may sleep with an easy mind, awake with an easy mind, and with an easy mind walk here among men, but the scorner utterly perishes. A twice born man who has been sanctified by the employment of the means, described above, in due order, shall gradually and cumulatively perform the various austerities prescribed for those who study the Veda. An Aryan must study the whole Veda together with the Rahasyas, performing at the same time various kinds of austerities and the vows prescribed by the rules of the Veda. Let a Brahmana who desires to perform austerities constantly repeat the Veda. For the study of the Veda is declared to be, in this world, the highest austerity for a Brahmana. Verily, that twice born man performs the highest austerity up to the extremities of his nails, who, though wearing a garland, daily recites the Veda in private to the utmost of his ability. A twice born man who, not having studied the Veda, applies himself to other and worldly study, soon falls, even while living to the condition of a sudra and his descendants, after him. According to the injunction of the revealed texts the first birth of an Aryan is from, his natural, mother, the second, happens, on the tying of the girdle of Munga grass, and the third on the initiation to, the performance of, a, srada, sacrifice. Among those, three, the birth which is symbolized by the investiture with the girdle of Munga grass, is his birth for the sake of the Veda, they declare that in that, birth, the Sivitri, verse, is his mother and the teacher his father. They call the teacher, the pupils, father because he gives the Veda, for nobody can perform a, sacred, right before the investiture with the girdle among the grass. He who has not been initiated, should not pronounce, any, Vedic text excepting, those required for, the performance of funeral rites, since he is, on a level with a sudra before his birth from the Veda. The student, who has been initiated, must be instructed in the performance of the vows, and gradually learn the Veda, observing the prescribed rules. Whatever dress of skin, sacred thread, girdle, staff, and lower garment are prescribed for a student at the initiation, the like, must again be used at the performance of the vows. But a student who resides with his teacher must observe the following restrictive rules, duly controlling all his organs, in order to increase his spiritual merit. Every day, having bathed and being purified, he must offer libations of water to the gods, sages, and manes. Worship the images of the gods and place fuel on the sacred fire. Let him abstain from honey, meat, perfumes, garlands, substances used for flavoring, food, women, all substances turned acid, and from doing injury to living creatures. From anointing his body, applying galerium to his eyes, from the use of shoes and of an umbrella or parasol from, sensual, desire, anger, covetousness, dancing, singing, and playing, musical instruments, from gambling, idle disputes, backbiting, and lying, from looking at and touching women, and from hurting others. Let him always sleep alone, let him never waste his manhood, for he who voluntarily wastes his manhood, breaks his vow. A twice-born student, who has involuntarily wasted his manly strength during sleep, must bathe, worship the sun, and afterwards thrice mutter the Rick verse, which begins, Again let my strength return to me. Let him fetch a pot full of water, flowers, cow dung, earth, and kusa grass, as much as may be required, by his teacher, and daily go to beg food. A student, being pure, shall daily bring food from the houses of men who are not deficient in, the knowledge of, the Veda and in, performing, sacrifices, and who are famous for, following their lawful, occupations. Let him not beg from the relatives of his teacher, nor from his own or his mother's blood relations, but if there, 
are no houses belonging to strangers, let him go to one of those named above, taking the last named first. Or, if there are no virtuous men of the kind mentioned above, he may go to each house in the village, being pure and remaining silent, but let him avoid abscesses, those accused of mortal sin. 186 Having brought sacred fuel from a distance, let him place it anywhere but on the ground, and let him, unwearied, make with it burnt oblations to the sacred fire, both evening and morning. He who, without being sick, neglects during seven successive days to go out begging, and to offer fuel in the sacred fire, shall perform the penance of an avakarnan, one who has broken his vow. He who performs the vow of studentship shall constantly subsist on alms, but not eat the food of one person only. The subsistence of a student on begged food is declared to be equal in merit to fasting. At his pleasure, he may eat when invited the food of one man at a right in honor of the gods, observing, however, the conditions on his vow or at a funeral meal in honor of the manes, behaving, however, like a hermit. This duty is prescribed by the wise for a brahmana only, but no such duty is ordained for a kachatriya and a vaisha. Both when ordered by his teacher, and without a special command, a student shall always exert himself in studying the Veda, and in doing what is serviceable to his teacher. Controlling his body, his speech, his organs, of sense, and his mind, let him stand with joined hands, looking at the face of his teacher, let him always keep his right arm uncovered, behave decently and keep his body well covered, and when he is addressed, with the words, be seated, he shall sit down, facing his teacher, in the presence of his teacher let him always eat less, wear a less valuable dress and ornaments, than the former, and let him rise earlier, from his bed, and go to rest later. Let him not answer or converse with his teacher, reclining on a bed, nor sitting, nor eating, nor standing, nor with an averted face. Let him do that, standing up, if his teacher is seated, advancing towards him when he stands, going to meet him if he advances, and running after him when he runs, going round to face the teacher, if his face is averted, approaching him if he stands at a distance, but bending towards him if he lies on a bed, and if he stands in a lower place. When his teacher is nigh, let his bed or seat be low, but within sight of his teacher he shall not sit carelessly at ease. Let him not pronounce the mere name of his teacher, without having an honorific title, behind his back even, and let him not mimic his gait, speech, and deportment. Wherever people justly censure or falsely defame his teacher, there he must cover his ears or depart thence to another place. By censuring his teacher, though justly, he will become, in his next birth, an ass, by falsely defaming him, a dog, he who lives on his teacher's substance, will become a worm, and he who is envious, of his merit, a, larger, insect. He must not serve the, teacher by the intervention of another, while he himself stands aloof, nor when he, himself, is angry, nor when a woman is near, if he is seated in a carriage or on a, raised, seat, he must descend and, afterwards salute his, teacher let him not sit with his teacher, to the leeward or to the windward, of him, nor let him say anything which his teacher cannot hear. He may sit with his teacher in a carriage drawn by oxen, horses, or camels, on a terrace, on a bed of grass or leaves, on a mat, on a rock, on a wooden bench, or in a boat. If his teacher's teacher is near, let him behave towards him, as towards his own teacher, but let him, unless he has received permission from his teacher, not salute venerable persons of his own family. This is likewise, ordained as, his constant behavior towards, other, instructors in science, towards his relatives, to whom honor is due, towards all who may restrain him from sin, or may give him salutary advice. Towards his betters let him always behave as towards his teacher, likewise towards sons of his teacher, born by wives of equal caste, 
and towards the teacher's relatives both on the side of the father and of the mother. The son of the teacher who imparts instruction, in his father's stead, whether younger or of equal age, or a student of, the science of, sacrifices, or of other angas, deserves the same honor as the teacher. A student must not shampoo the limbs of his teacher's son, nor assist him in bathing, nor eat the fragments of his food, nor wash his feet. The wives of the teacher, who belong to the same caste, must be treated as respectfully as the teacher, but those who belong to a different caste, must be honored by rising and salutation. Let him not perform for a wife of his teacher, the offices of, anointing her, assisting her in the bath, shampooing her limbs, or arranging her hair. A pupil, who is full twenty years old, and knows what is becoming and unbecoming, shall not salute a young wife of his teacher, by clasping, her feet. It is the nature of women to seduce men in this, world. For that reason the wise are never unguarded in, the company of, females for women are able to lead astray in, this, world not only a fool, but even a learned man, and, to make, him a slave of desire and anger. One should not sit in a lonely place with one's mother, sister, or daughter, for the senses are powerful, and master even a learned man. But at his pleasure a young student may prostrate himself on the ground before the young wife of a teacher, in accordance with the rule, and say, I, N, N, worship thee, O lady. On returning from a journey he must clasp the feet of his teacher's wife and daily salute her, in the manner just mentioned, remembering the duty of the virtuous. As the man who digs with a spade, into the ground, obtains water, even so an obedient, pupil, obtains the knowledge which lies, hidden, in his teacher. A student, may either shave his head, or wear his hair in braids, or braid one lock on the crown of his head. The sun must never set or rise while he, lies asleep, in the village. If the sun should rise or set while he is sleeping, be it, that he offended, intentionally or unintentionally, he shall fast during the, next, day, muttering, the savagery. For he who lies, sleeping, while the sun, sets or rises, and does not perform, that, penance, is tainted by great guilt. Purified by sipping water, he shall daily worship during both twilights with a concentrated mind in a pure place, muttering the prescribed text according to the rule. If a woman or a man of low caste perform anything, leading to, happiness, let him diligently practice it, as well as, any other permitted act, in which his heart finds pleasure. Some declare that, the chief good consists in, the acquisition of, spiritual merit and wealth, others place it, in, the gratification of, desire and, the acquisition of, wealth, others, in, the acquisition of, spiritual merit alone, and, others say that the teacher, the father, the mother, and an elder brother must not be treated with disrespect, especially by a brahmana, though one be grievously offended, by them. The teacher is the image of Braham, the father the image of Prajapati, the lord of created beings, the mother the image of the earth, and an elder, full brother the image of oneself. That trouble and pain, which the parents undergo on the birth of their children, cannot be compensated even in a hundred years. Let him always do what is agreeable to those, too, and always, what may please, his teacher, when those three are pleased, he obtains all those rewards which austerities yield. Obedience towards those three is declared to be the best form of austerity. Let him not perform other meritorious acts without their permission. For they are declared to be the three worlds, they the three principal orders, they the three Vedas, and they the three sacred fires. The father, forsooth, is stated to be the Garhapatya fire, the mother the Dakshinagni, but the teacher the Ahavanaya fire. This triad of fires is most venerable. He who neglects not those three, even after he has become a householder, will conquer the three worlds and, radiant in body like a god, he will enjoy bliss in heaven. By honoring his mother he gains this nether world. 
by honoring his father the middle sphere, but by obedience to his teacher the world of Braham. All duties have been fulfilled by him. Who honors those three, but to him who honors them not, all rights remain fruitless. As long as those three live, so long let him not, independently, perform any other, meritorious acts, let him always serve them, rejoicing, to do what is, agreeable and beneficial, to them. He shall inform them of everything that with their consent he may perform in thought, word, or deed for the sake of. The next world dot by, honoring, these three all that ought to be done by man, is accomplished, that is clearly the highest duty, every other, act, is a subordinate. Duty dot he who possesses faith may receive pure learning even from a man of lower caste, the highest law even from the lowest, and an excellent wife even from a base family dot even from poison nectar may be taken. Even from a child good advice, even from a foe, a lesson in, good conduct, and even from an impure, substance, gold dot excellent wives, learning, the knowledge of, the law, the rules of, purity, good advice, and various arts may be acquired from anybody. It is prescribed that in times of distress a student may learn the Veda from one who is not a Brahmana, and that he shall walk behind and serve such a teacher as long as the instruction lasts. He who desires incomparable bliss in heaven shall not dwell during his whole life in the house of a non Brahmanical teacher, nor with a Brahmana who does not know the whole Veda and the Angas. But if a student desires to pass his whole life in the teacher's house, he must diligently serve him, until he is freed from this body. A Brahmana who serves his teacher till the dissolution of his body, reaches forthwith the eternal mansion of Braham. He who knows the sacred law must not present any gift to his teacher before the Samavartana, but when, with the permission of his teacher, he is about to take the final bath, let him procure a present. For the venerable man. According to his ability, viz, a field, gold, a cow, a horse, a parasol and shoes, a seat, grain, even vegetables, and thus, give pleasure to his teacher. A perpetual student, must, if his teacher dies, serve his son, provided he be, endowed with good qualities, or his widow, or his sapinda, in the same manner as the teacher. Should none of these be alive, he must serve the sacred fire, standing, by day, and sitting, during the night, and thus finish his life. A Brahmana who thus passes his life as a student without breaking his vow, reaches, after death, the highest abode and will not be born again in this world. The vow, of studying, the three Vedas under a teacher must be kept for 36 years, or for half that time, or for a quarter, or until the student has perfectly learnt them.